I'm talking about ice, I'm talking about all the different drugs on the street that might be sold as shard, crystal, glass, skates, under various names. Now, I'm kind of assuming here that you don't have a lot of personal experience with this, but I'm sorry if you do and I'm boring you. Um, but essentially, I want to make the point that these drugs have been around in Australia on the street for a while, but, and they come in different physical forms and under different street names. But they all contain the same molecule, which is methamphetamine. And this is a, a molecule or a drug that's got a really long and is interesting history. I mean, it's actually a fairly contemporary thing that it's been illegal. Uh, it, it was discovered in Japan around about the turn of the century, uh, early 1900s. And it was used heavily in uh, World War II by the Japanese, um, but also by the, the Germans as Perviton. And then the Americans started to understand why they were losing the war, and they started taking amphetamine. At about the same time, the Germans worked out that maybe it wasn't such a great idea, <laughs> and, and the uh, English started winning the war. Anyways, so it's, the point is here, it's got a long history. After the war, it got dumped onto the civilian market, and I find this quite amusing. You can actually see it on the Pan Am um, uh, menu here. A benzodrine inhaler, which you can see pictured here, um, under service items, you could uh, pick up a, a tube which contains cotton strips impregnated with amphetamine base oil, and you can sniff this, and it, it relieves the uh, ills associated with the flight. It's a great decongestant. Um, <laughs> and then pharmaceutical companies went wild. Uh, they discovered it was Mother's Little Helper. It was a great mood pick-me-up. Um, so, but it was around this time, this was during the 1950s and 60s, where it became so popular that people worked out they could dismantle those little uh, benzodrine inhaler tins and they would start eating the cotton strips. And that wasn't so good. <laughs> and so what would be happening is the police would be picking up people who were behaving strangely, over-intoxicated, and in some cases a little bit psychotic. Um, and it, at the time it was a very popular thing, it was profitable, so there was a lot of pushback saying, well, this is a safe drug, it's not really addictive, it's only a stimulant, as they did with nicotine. Um, and if someone went mad on it, they said, well, they're probably mad beforehand. <clears throat> and to settle this argument, in the 19, um, late 1960s, early 70s, there were a series of studies that uh, experimentally produced psychosis. I'm showing you this one because it was done in Sydney um, at the Rosehill Hospital. <clears throat> and what David Bell did was he, he gave people uh, high doses of methamphetamine intravenously and observed the symptoms that they exhibited and then took the drug away and looked at how long it lasted. And this, together with the other experimental inductions, provided pretty compelling evidence that this drug was capable of precipitating a psychotic reaction. It's primarily paranoia, sometimes with hallucinations, and occasionally other symptoms. It, in this study, because he took the drug away, he found out most people recovered pretty quickly with a bit of sleep. Um, some of the symptoms were residual, but usually it went away. And also, in a couple of the patients, the symptoms came on within a day. So even, it's not to say that sleep deprivation doesn't contribute to this phenomenon, but rather that it's not a necessary thing to get the psychosis. So it's quite a strong psychosis that comes on. So because of these problems, it came under international control. And in most countries, um, well, pretty much all countries, maybe not North Korea, I understand, but um, <laughs> in most countries, it's very heavily regulated. It's still used in medicine, obviously, as you would know. Um, dexamphetamine is available here in Australia for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and the consumption, prescription consumption of that's increased globally. Um, it's also prescribed for narcolepsy, and less often these days for obesity because of the risk of dependence. In, in the US, methamphetamine is also on prescription, um, but it isn't used as much, obviously, because it's got high dependence liability. And because of this prescription use, we have pretty good ideas, pretty good information on the side effects. You can see here, and if you're wondering what the eye is over there, that's just the dilated pupil um, that you get with stimulants. But you can see all the classic um, side effects of stimulant use that you would expect to see in someone who's intoxicated. 
And it also comes with some really strong warnings, tolerance and dependence, risk of cardiovascular problems, slows growth in kids, uh, risk of seizures, and psychiatric effects. So these are all the types of things that we see play out in the illicit drug market. Now naturally, because even though it's been regulated, um, people still like the effects of it, so there's still a lot of illicit drug use. Now this is a clandestine laboratory in Australia. It's quite an old one. You can see the pseudoephedrine pills there, the little, um, the red pills, which are now not so readily available in Australia for this reason. Um, and when people made the drug in these backyard laboratories, it was pretty poor quality and they wanted to stretch it out a long way. So your typical, what you would buy on the street was about 5% pure, mostly sugar. Um, and people didn't get that high from it. Nonetheless, the doses that they took, this is very approximate, if you took speed, you'd probably be getting two to three times the prescribed dose. So you get a much better high, and I'm just making the point that your medication is not the same thing as the, um, the illicit drug in terms of dose. So that's what was happening in Australia. Now, the people over in Malaysia did it much better. This was uh, seized in 19, uh, 2006. Um, or detected. Um, it was estimated that it produced 280 tonnes of methamphetamine per annum. And these labs were popping up in Cambodia, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Myanmar. High scale production. So, um, for those of you familiar with chemistry, these are the reaction vessels, these are the chemicals, and this lab is set up to make methamphetamine. So, you can imagine the output consequence, very good product, essentially pure, um, and this is actually a photo from uh, one of the, the police laboratory in Victoria, seized in Victoria. So very, very clear crystals, effectively pure, um, and a much, much higher dose. And so what we've seen over the past decade or two is the influx of this from Southeast Asia into Australia. So it comes back to the dose issue that G brought up, that what we've seen here is an increase in the purity of methamphetamine in Australia because crystal meth is now the dominant form of meth that's available. The other thing that's really important in understanding the effect of these drugs is how they're taken. And this is often overlooked. Um, I'm sorry this is a really ghastly photo. I couldn't find a good one of someone <laughs> swallowing speed. But basically, if you swallow speed, I mean, you're wasting a lot of money. Um, you, you're losing half of it in your gut. And I'll show you a graph in a minute uh, that'll show you how long it takes to get high if you notice that you get high at all. So people pretty quickly realise, well, you're better off snorting it. Now, it's very alkaline. If you've ever tried to put two grams of sugar up, you know, as you can imagine how hard it is, let alone something that burns your sinuses. And very quickly, you'll end up with ulcers. So people, if they're really serious about getting high, move to injection. Not a good story, um, and usually they develop tolerance very quickly. But the reason they do this is because, and I apologise for my inability to use technology to draw this graph. Um, <laughs> it's a bit play school. <laughs> I gave up. So basically, this is your high. If you swallow it, about 40 minutes later, you go, oh, yeah, I'm feeling a bit better. It's quite good. Um, but it's a pretty subtle effect. If you snort it, you know, 10 or 15 minutes later, you're going to start to feel good and you feel better than if you swallowed it. If you inject it, you get what's called a rush and it's a pretty instant effect um, and you get much, well, 100% bioavailability. Now, the, I guess the good thing, if you can say this, is that most people don't want to go and inject a drug. It's pretty marginalised, stigmatised behaviour. So, we had a lot of problems amongst people who were injecting amphetamine through the 90s, but that was in a pretty small group of people. What we've seen over the past 10 years is that crystal meth, because it's so pure, you can smoke it. You try smoking that speed stuff, it's just sugar, and you end up with toffee. This is a different story. The bioavailability, if you smoke it right, is pretty much like injection. The onset of action is actually slightly faster than injection. Uh, it doesn't have to go through the heart, it goes straight into the lung system. So people get very high from it. And this is a, a description of a young person, again coming back to the adolescence, of what it feels like. 
And eventually I had my first smoke and I was blown away. The euphoria I was feeling, feelings of well-being and just being invincible. And just this feeling of closeness to everyone and relating to people, talking, having fun, dancing. Just a deep appreciation of everything in life. Who's not, what's not to like there? So this is a very Moorish drug for young people. <laughs>